You'll see here on March the 19th, which is next Saturday, uh, I'll be having practice with everyone who can at 10 o'clock next Saturday morning. And we'll go over the whole program because on March the 20th, which is next Sunday already, is Palm Sunday. And that is the day that we will be having our program. The name of our program is He's Alive. And uh, I'm really excited about this. So please try to be here next Sunday. And, um, and especially be here Saturday for the practice. I'll practice with the children. They'll need to be here too at, eight, at 10 o'clock. And um, they will be here till at least 11 to go through their part. They don't have to stay the whole time for the whole program or practice, but I do need them for at least an hour, maybe an hour and a half with the kids. Oh, great. Is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. Oh, Thank you. 
How many know he's great this morning? Amen. 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 God bless you this morning. Good to see you today in your father's house on this rainy, set your clock up an hour day. Yeah, it looks like that we're, some folks are still sleeping. If we can just continue to uh, keep backing it up, I think it started out years ago, uh, six months, six months, and change of the time. Seems like now it's going about eight months to four months. So maybe somebody will get wise enough just to leave it alone. Uh, no matter how intelligent we get, they're not going to change the sun. The S-U-N sun, <laughs> even. Praise the Lord. Well, I hope you've had a good week, <clears throat> a prosperous week, and that the Lord has blessed you. And that he's given you strength, and I know that he does. And he has always been a God that is a sustaining God. We live in our world that sometimes it uh, looks a little bleak and a little dismal maybe, but in the world of the Christian, in the kingdom of God, when we're citizens of this great kingdom, there's really never a bad day and any days that are not real good. The Holy Spirit just makes it better, doesn't He? Regardless of Amen. what takes place or what goes on. <clears throat> a burglar broke into a home and was looking around. He heard a soft voice say, Jesus is watching you. <laughs> Thinking it was just his imagination, he continued his search. Again, the voice said, Jesus is watching you. He turned his flashlight around, saw a parrot in a cage, and he asked the parrot if he was the one talking and the parrot said, yes. He asked the parrot what his name was. And the parrot said, Moses. The burglar asked what kind of people would name a parrot Moses. The parrot said, the same kind of people that would name their pit bull Jesus. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <clears throat> and would you shake someone's hand this morning and say, I've come to worship the Lord God today. Hallelujah. <clears throat> I realize sometimes when there's some sickness around and sometimes people are unable to attend, it uh, seems to have somewhat of a negative effect on us. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. <laughs> I'd also like to uh, just take a brief moment this morning and uh, remind us that April the 7th through April the 10th, uh, the Central District for our churches, uh, we'll be uh, convening our, we're going to call it Spring Celebration Camp Meeting because I don't think they've ever had the... Uh, District Convention, we called it over the years, camp meeting now, whatever you will, the gathering for the prospective districts. It's always been in February, and I think the last uh, couple of years, as I've been serving in this uh, district uh, pastor position, I think last year we lost two days of the gathering because the weather was so bad, and I think the year before that we lost a, a day or two. <clears throat> And so hopefully that we will be able to have four days or four nights of this. And uh, just quickly, it will begin on the 7th of April at 7 o'clock at our Community Park Church in Columbus. We'll be there Friday night, Saturday night. Th I'm sorry, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night. Then we're going to finish our conference or our camp meeting here at our local church. So I want to encourage you if you can. I really don't know any other way to, to split this up because... Columbus is pretty much central, and so anyway, there you go. You've been informed, and Al, Al D is going to put it in the bulletin. So there's a lot of things that are going on, and uh, our world needs our Savior, doesn't it? Yeah. And uh, I don't know about you, but I hope you have been praying and seeking the Lord diligently, and I hope that you're going to voice your vote this 
Tuesday. And uh, I pray that you're asking God to direct you and the decision and the person that you uh, express yourself for to become the president of our country in the election this November. Uh, I, I would encourage you, I'm not a politician, never have been, uh, but I, I'm learning some things about our government and about our leadership and so on that I do want to encourage God's people to get more involved in this, to express yourself. You pray and you seek the Lord. I hear people say it really doesn't matter about my vote, but if a hundred thousand people vote and half of them said they wouldn't vote, then there's quite a number of people that have decided that they were going to vote and you never can tell. But I want us to be encouraged to vote and you allow the Holy Spirit, you listen, you listen attentively. Uh, just for your information, it probably doesn't matter to you, but I've missed little to none of the debates, and I'm like yourself. I, I grow weary with some of it. I, I, I really do, but <clears throat> we are in this world. We live here. We're just temporary residents here, but uh, since we do live here and we do have this great freedom, I don't want to see any more of our freedoms attacked or taken away from us. Amen. By all means, the freedom Amen. of worship. So Amen. we want to express ourselves and the freedom... <clears throat> to uh, continue to express ourselves. Turn your Bibles, if you will, this morning uh, to Psalms, the 119th Division, Psalms 119. And I want to read verses 1 through verses 8. The Bible says, Joyful are people of integrity who follow the instructions of the Lord. Joyful are those who obey His laws and search for Him with all of their hearts. They do not compromise with evil. They do not compromise with evil. How many believe that? Amen. And they walk only in His paths. Verse 4. You have charged us, God, you have charged us to keep your commandments carefully. Everybody say carefully. carefully. Oh, that my actions, and I hope you can put your personal name in there, Oh, that my actions would consistently reflect your decrees. Then I will not be ashamed when I compare my life with your commands. And as I learn your righteous regulations, I will thank you. God, I will thank you by living as I should. I will obey your decrees. Please don't give up on me. Father, I thank you this morning as I always do. For your wonderful, rich, written word. It's a lamp to my feet. And it's a light, God, to my path. And I am grateful for your word. I'm thankful for your sweet Holy Spirit. I pray this morning, Lord, that you will use this flesh and clay. Lord, that you will use my vocal cords today to speak the word of the living God. I pray for your anointing, Lord, as you know how I feel in my heart. I cannot succeed and preach and teach this glorious gospel without your help and without your anointing. So I submit to that, O oh God, this morning. I humble myself before you and before this congregation today. And Holy Spirit is always in my prayer before I minister the gospel. If there's one person today, if there's one person that will watch this YouTube this week that does not know Jesus Christ as Lord and as Savior, may that be their moment in time when they view this video. And Father, go before me right now and I surrender it all to you. In the wonderful, lovely, everlasting name of Jesus Christ, my personal Lord and Savior. And everybody said, <clears throat> Amen. Amen. I want to read verse 6 again, maybe verse 5 and 6. Oh, that my actions would consistently reflect your decrees. Then I will not be ashamed when I compare my life with your commands. I want to use that for a message title this morning. Comparing our lives to God's command. That should be the chief desire of every born again believer today. The word compare means to represent as similar. It means liken. It means to bear being compared. It means to be equal or alike. Comparing our lives to God's 
commands. This is my prayer today, and I trust that it is yours also, that my actions, my personal actions, would consistently and will consistently reflect God's word, God's decrees. And that my actions would be equal to His commands. Do you feel that way this morning? That your life would consistently reflect the word of the living God. You'll drop down to verse 15 in that same chapter in the New King James Version. The scripture said, I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. The Hebrew word for precept here is a commandment. It is a statute. It is a mandate. It is something appointed or authorized by God. I know you know this, but God's word is not a request. What this wonderful book declares to us from Genesis throughout Revelation, it is not a request, it is a requirement of Almighty God. Then, my, then I will not be ashamed when I compare my life with your commands or with your word. There is an evangelist, a prominent evangelist that said recently, and I heard them say, say this at first, it set me back for just a moment, but it didn't take me long to recognize what he really meant. He said, I don't care what the Bible says, I want to know what the Bible says. Because if you know what it says, you will care what it says, you will care about its Decrees, you will care about its precepts, you will care about what has been authorized by God Almighty Himself. David Watson, an English author, lived from 1933 till 1984. He was an English author and evangelist, started out being a priest in Catholicism and so on. But he wrote this Why is the Christian church so ineffective? It is because Christians in the West have largely neglected what it means to be a disciple of Christ. The vast majority, he said, of Christians are church members. They're pew fillers. He said they're hymn singers. They are sermon tasters. They are Bible readers. Even born-again believers are spirit-filled Pentecostals, but not true disciples of Christ. He said, if we were to learn the meaning of true discipleship and actually become disciples, the church in the West would be transformed and the result impact on society would be staggering. And I'd like to give that a great big amen uh, this morning. Hallelujah. Let me say that again. He said, if we were to learn meaning, the meaning of a true discipleship. How many here this morning really want to be a true disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ? You don't want to just talk about it anymore. Necessarily hear someone with the ability to teach on discipleship. Or hear ministers preach about discipleship. You have a desire down in your inner being. That you want to walk in the discipleship of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Again, he said if we were to learn the meaning of true discipleship and actually become disciples, the church in the West would be transformed and the result impact on society would be staggering. And I believe that this morning with all of my heart. And I'm preaching comparing our lives to God's commands. Our actions, your actions and my actions must reflect God's Word. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, the Scripture said, the Apostle teaching the church at Corinth, he said, for we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves. I could say a lot about that, but I won't take the time right now. But then he said, they are measuring themselves by themselves And comparing themselves among themselves, Paul said, 
you're not wise. Hear that again. They are measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves and they're not wise at all. Every born again believer must begin to compare yourself as an individual Christian, as a disciple of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You must begin to compare your life with the commandments of Almighty God. If you believe that, would somebody shout, <coughs> praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I know all of you probably sitting in here this morning remember the old song that we used to sing, Let's Forget About Ourselves. Sometimes it's hard to forget about yourself, isn't it? Yes. But the old song said, Let's forget about ourselves and concentrate on Him and worship Christ our Lord. Amen. Oh, praise God. And I, I, can, I, I only continue in this flow is because the Holy Spirit is burning this in my heart. I'm not even sure I understand why he's doing this, but I hope you know me. You've known me long enough and trust me well enough to know that it's, it's not in my demeanor to endeavor to please man. It's not in my endeavor to just speak words to you that will simply make you feel good just for the sake of making you feel good. But I believe it is imperative for we ministers in these last days to be very conscientious of the Word of God and for every one of us in particular to compare our personal lives, comparing our lives to God's command. To me, that is, uh, th that is just totally imperative, I believe, in the will and in the work of the Lord. Much is being said in today's church world about seeker-friendly Churches. I don't know how many of you have really given that much attention. I, I briefly uh, now and again say something about it. But there's a lot being said in the church world today about seeker-friendly churches. And they're trying to find ways to make unsaved people comfortable in their pews. And as I was putting this together uh, this week, and I, I, I've had a lot of meditation and I've given a lot of thought to this and in my own heart personally because I am responsible for uh, feeding the flock of God. That's just, the way, that's just the way that it is. But they're trying to find ways to make unsaved people uncomfortable in their pews. But as I was studying this and meditating upon this, the thought, the inspiration I believe come from God, I personally... I'm curious as to why they want unsaved people to be comfortable in our church pews versus teaching them that their lives can and should compare with God's Word. Amen. Amen. And, and, and let me be very clear with you this morning. I, and I, I am I'm really I'm, I'm dealing with me with all of this because I am part of all of this. I'm part of a, a ministry uh, uh, brotherhood in our community. And I, and I hear this. I hear this over and over and over. I hear about churches. And this is most especially uh, in, in and among the larger churches, how that they have become and they are encouraging every church to become a seeker friendly church. And I touched this just a little bit last Sunday night. I don't, I don't mean to I don't mean just to use this as a whipping post because I'm not, but it frightens me. It not only frightens me for the atmosphere and the influence that can fall upon the churches, it concerns me about the people that we're trying to reach in the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when we go out two by two, one or, or a dozen at a time, and we go into communities even such as ours, and they're knocking on doors and, and they're asking people. Listen, they're asking sinner people. How many remember what it's like to be a sinner? Boy, they would have really hit, hit a gold mine if they would come knock on my door before I give my heart to Jesus and said, young man, how would you like for us to conduct ourselves in our church? Because we want you to come and be a part of our church. What do you think we should do? Well, 
This is my point this morning. And God has been dealing with my heart this week. And I hope somebody that will catch this and someone that will hear this and, and can get in the same state of mind that I am with it. I've searched the scripture. I've looked especially into the New Testament church, the, in the, at the church of the book of Acts. And I've examined these apostles and I've looked it, into the word of God. And I cannot find any place at all that has been written in the inspired, inerrant, inexhaustible, everlasting word of God that will express to a church, to the body of Christ, to go out into the community and try to get people to come to church and and hear the message of the cross but before they do that ask them what that they believe that their church could do that would be satisfactory to them or make them comfortable in their pews or in their local church I have not been able to find that anywhere in the gospel at all but I am finding in the gospel and I want to say that again they're trying to find ways to make unsaved people comfortable in their pews I want to reiterate but I am personally curious as to why they want unsaved people to be comfortable versus teaching them it is our job it is the ministry's position it is the body of Christ's job is to disciple people People that come off of the streets that come out of that sinful walk it is our responsibility to disciple them it is our responsibility to preach and teach to them with the abundant love of God and the mercy and grace of God that they can come out of this world and that Jesus will set them free <laughs> huh. I feel like a lone ranger sometimes do you ever feel like a Lone Ranger and you're preaching this? I, I, but you know, I, if I have to get me a mask and a big white hat, I'll just do whatever. <laughs> I am one of the good guys. I'm not your enemy. I'm, I, I'm just concerned about things that are transpiring. And I know it doesn't affect this church right here immediately right now. But I'm, I'm telling you, this is what is going on. This is what is transpiring uh, in our world. Listen, Jesus said to everyone in John 14 and 15, this was a very broad place statement that Jesus made. He made this to the world. He said to everyone, every living soul, he would say to the 7 billion people on our planet earth today, Jesus would say this. He would say, if you love me, keep my commandments. Hallelujah. I don't want to be misunderstood. And I, I want us as a body of Christ, I want us to fill these pews. I, I really mean that. But the world cannot and does not understand spiritual things. The world is not com concerned about comparing their personal lives with the Word and the commandments of God. That is the least of their concern. So our main objective is not to ask people what we can do to make them comfortable when they come to the church, when they come to the local bodies of Christ, but it is our responsibility to teach the Word, to preach the Word with the fires of Pentecost, and to declare in their hearing that Jesus Christ is is the holy hope of this world. And if we make the place of God, the house of God, so comfortable for you to come, you know what will happen to the church. We'll stop preaching the cross. We won't preach, we won't preach that gory message of the blood of Jesus Christ anymore because it makes people uncomfortable. It makes them where they cannot be relaxed. I don't want people to come to church to get relaxed. I don't want to reach out into the world and bring them into the house of God and to allow them to be made comfortable sitting in their sins coming here maybe and saying hallelujah down again and going back out into the world and continuing to serve their master the devil I want them to know that Jesus of Nazareth hallelujah is walking by this way and he has the solution to the problems he has the answer to all of the questions hallelujah Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. 
And church, I trust you'll stay with me on this. Jesus said, if you love me, he said, keep my commandments. John 19 and 17, the latter part of that verse, you can read it all. They'll put it on the PowerPoint. But he said again, if you want, listen to me. Oh, listen to me, everybody, today. If you want to receive eternal life. If you love me, he said, keep my commandments. And he even went a step further. He said, if you want to receive eternal life. I don't know about you, but I've already received her eternal life. I'm on my way to heaven. This world can do whatever it wants to do. And quite frankly, the church can do what it wants to do. But I've made up my mind every single day of my life. Hallelujah. I'm going to endeavor to do the best I can that my personal life will reflect God's word. So I can compare my life with this glorious book that I hold in my hand. Well, just stop this stuff about nobody can be perfect. We're all smart enough to know that. Amen. Nobody's going to do right all the time, but you don't have to sin. When you've been set free and when you've been delivered... You can leave that life and you can walk into this wonderful, marvelous light as the scripture said. He called me. Christ called me out of darkness into His marvelous light. You don't have to go back to the darkness. You don't have to search for a church that has a pew that will make you comfortable and relax. Hallelujah. You need a church that will set your soul on fire. We need preachers and teachers that will pray with the word of God that won't jeopardize your soul. But we be men and women of God that will declare in your presence, learn glory to God, endeavor to be able to compare your personal life with this wonderful book. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, God, please help me to stay right. Keep a right spirit about this. <clears throat> I was in a meeting just this week. Multiple pastors. Most of them, if not all of them, are my dear friends. There was a, a gentleman that came in the door and we were getting ready, we were getting ready to leave. And this man, probably 50, 52 years old, seemed sensible, seemed like he may have been an, a, an educated man, but he come over and he sat down where we were sitting. And he said to us, he said, pastors, I can, I can see that you're getting ready to to break up your meeting and leave. But he asked us. He said, would you please give me three minutes of your time? I want to share something with you that God has revealed to me. So we all, courteous, we're pastors, we want to hear. I want to hear what people have to say. It's going to make any kind of sense at all. And, and Bishop Lawson, he, he began to speak. And when he did, he began to talk about how that God, uh, he kind of reminded me of how that myself, you and many of us, that the Holy Spirit revealed us years ago that uh, we're not under the law. We don't live under uh, the Jewish laws. Those 611 little uh, things that that they believe that you had to do. We, we learned years ago, you can't work yourself to heaven. There's nothing you can do to earn heaven. That's just, because of, but only because of grace. Now, I want to keep that clear before this church too. That doesn't mean you just run off and forget about the Ten Commandments. You can't do that either. But anyway, we agree to let him speak to us. And as he began to speak, he said this. He said, I want to share with you that 
in the last couple of years, I believe he said a couple of years, he said, the Holy Spirit has been revealing to me and giving me some fresh revelation. And he said, how that we are no longer under the law. And he was, he was getting ready to bash Israel. And how that, because the Jewish tradition is still, they sacrifice and they do a lot of the temple and the feast and so on and so forth. And, and he, he, he was saying that since we, uh, the dispensation of grace, all of that is, is gone. It's, 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 it's done away with. And I, you know, I was okay until the next part of his subject. He said, and we know that water baptism was a law. And he said the Lord had revealed to him that it's no longer important to be baptized in water. Can I tell you without you thinking your pastor's got a mean streak in him? You know what I did? I didn't bow my head and ask the Lord what I needed to do. I got right up in front of him and my pastor brethren and God. I looked across the table at him. I said, listen, friend. I don't have time to listen to that foolishness. Amen. Church, it really doesn't matter which side the fence that they may be on. When it comes to the word of, the God, of God, there is no two sides of the fence. There's only one side, and it's God's side. There's only one God, hallelujah. There's only one Jesus, and He's the only way to the Father. And if you get there, if we get there, that's the way we're going to go. I don't believe people go to hell when some get saved and don't have an opportunity to get baptized in water. I'm going to get you yet, Red. <laughs> Just don't tell some of these folks you haven't been baptized yet. Let's do it. My God. If you, want, if you want to receive eternal life, keep the commandments. What is it about that that people are having such a struggle over. 3 John verse 3 and 4. <clears throat> For I rejoiced greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you. Just as you walk, everybody shout walk. walk. Just as you walk in truth. Amen. Then this blessed apostle said, to those that he had been involved in teaching and ministering to, and he was excited. He said, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Amen. Oh, I, I committed this, I preached this so many times over the years. But the Greek word for walk means to live. It means to be Occupied with. Oh, praise God. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. I have no greater joy than to hear my children are occupied with truth. Yeah. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children live, live in truth. Oh, Amen. church, hallelujah. We've got to catch this today. If we don't, we're going to get caught up in the false teaching. That's right. Yeah, that's right. There is nothing new under the sun. That's right. I've gotten so weary with prophet after prophet getting in God's way, trying to declare that this is something new, some new revelation. You may get a fresh anointing. You may get a revelation from God and the Holy Spirit that you've never received before, but it's not new. That's right. Listen. <clears throat> no greater joy to hear my children walk in truth. These are my italics. But if you want to receive eternal life, how many want to receive eternal life? Walk, be occupied with, live in truth. It is imperative that our life be compared to God's truth. It is imperative. It is mandatory that our actions reflect God's Word. Remember, God has charged. God has charged.
charged you and I to keep his commandments carefully. She's got to do something. She's, she's do preach, preach. Listen, I, I want you to get this. Remember, God has charged you. Look at somebody say, that means you. He has charged us to keep his commandments. Yes. And he didn't just stop there. He said, carefully. Yes. Now, yes. let Cindy get on. Don't pay any attention to her. Right. Pay attention to me. Oh. Listen to me. She don't want your attention anyway. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying this morning? Amen. If you know someone that's looking for a church, listen, please understand me. Let's get together if there's some things you want to change about. I, I said this a few weeks ago. The message is divine. Our methods are not divine. If you want to change some of our methods, I have an ear to hear. I'm all right with that. But don't ever expect me to change the divine message that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost has empowered in my being. I will not back away. I will not relinquish my faith in the old rugged cross. We're getting ready to celebrate Easter, the great resurrection day. I will never, never, never. Sugarcoat this. Dilute it. Because it is the only way for this world to have peace anywhere, anytime. Yes. Carefully. God has charged us to keep His commandments carefully. Carefully. Oh, Quit trying to find a way out of this. Christians, on bumper sticker after bumper sticker, Christians are not perfect, they're just forgiven. Amen. That's what we are. Amen. That's right. But you can't use that little slogan to justify your life not reflecting God's Word. We all know, come on, we're intelligent people. We all know that Christians, we're not perfect. But I'm telling you right now, I'm doing everything I can every day to keep myself and look at the commandments careful and look at the Word of God and search the Scripture and study the Word to be sure that my life is reflecting this book. When you look in the mirror, I was going to bring our mirror down today. I was going to use a little illustration, but it was too big. And you know what I was going to do? I was going to stand it right out in the middle of the floor. And it's one of those mirrors that you, it's, full, it's a full mirror. Probably everybody in here but red. Red might be a bit tall, but Lawson may be. But most all of you could have stood directly in front of you. And I was going to have you just come up and do it quickly. And then as you walked away, say, who is it that you just saw in that mirror? You call yourself by name. I look in that mirror, I see me. But listen to me. When you look in this mirror, there you go. There you go. when you look in this grand book that I hold in my hand, are, are you, listen to me this morning, precious saints. When you look in this book, when you open the covers of this book and you begin to read it and meditate, as the psalmist said, meditate upon his precepts. Do you see yourself? Oh God. Each one of us can live a Christian life. Every one of you sitting here this morning, all of us can live a Christian life that will reflect God's Word. Amen. <clears throat> Please, I oh, forgot. We, we, we must get some of this, these fallacies, some of this junk that's going around, all around us. We've got to get back into the simplicity, back into the Word of God, and trust His Word, and let our lives reflect His Word. You say, Pastor, but everybody fails. Everybody makes mistakes. Everybody 
does something at some point in time uh, that they know that's not right. But everybody that has a desire, everybody when you look at this wonderful book and you can see yourself because you're endeavoring, you're striving to be like this book, you're striving to compare your own personal life with this book, you must stop thinking about all your failures, failures and start thinking about your victories. Because every time a real believer falls or fails, he or she doesn't lie there. They get up, shake themselves off, and say, Jesus, ooh, I know that's wrong. Would you forgive me? Yes. But then you keep looking in the mirror. Yes. I don't know why anybody can't understand that. To me, that's as simple as... Two and two is four, except for this common core <laughs> stuff now. It's two and two is nine or something. Or you've got to go a different way to get that. We need to take a look in, our, in this mirror every day. We need to look at the Word of God and declare what it says. Declare what it says to me. I am more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. Yeah. I can't overcome this world. There is no temptation that ever comes upon me. It's common to man. God's faithful. He'll make a way for that temptation that it will overwhelm me. He'll make a way of escape. He'll make a way that I won't fall by the wayside and lie there in the field. I can tell you now, it's going to take some effort to live like that. It's gotten too easy to listen to these limp-wristed preachers that are preaching enough to mess people's minds up. That's right. A pastor, just this recent, last week, a pastor of a large mega church in New York, and please don't misunderstand, it is not my job, it is not my character to tear down anyone. I'm not trying to tear anyone down. I'm trying to get us to understand that our lives must reflect the Word of God if we're expecting to have eternal life with Christ. The pastor of a large mega church in New York has recently been prompting all gays welcome. I have no problem with that at all. I would simply say all drug addicts, all alcoholics, Amen. all liars, Amen. all prostitutes, Amen. all homosexuals, all cheaters and swindlers and the list could go on. All sinners welcome. And then treat. This is where I fear that the church is missing a very important factor of the gospel. Welcome people regardless of their background, regardless of their culture, regardless of their sexual orientation, regardless of how much sin that they have been in. Do you ever hear? Do you ever hear men and women that are pretty bad about drinking brag on which one drunk the most whiskey? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. My God! But we welcome all sinners, Amen. and then treat every sinner accordingly, as Jesus did. If you're going to love Jesus, then keep His commandments. Amen. If you're going to receive eternal life, then you must endeavor to compare your life with His Word. We must, the world must, our community must take eternal life seriously. Amen. The late great British preacher Charles Spurgeon said, I would recommend... You either believe God up to the hilt or else not believe at all. He said, believe this book of God, every letter of it, or else reject it. Amen. There is no logical standing place between the two. Somebody said, you can't pay any attention to these old preachers, old Charles Spurgeon and D.L. Moody and some of these guys, listen to me. Oh God, if I die before you do and go before the rapture takes place, I want you to put something on my tombstone.
stone. I want you to write something over my grave that this was one preacher that stayed with the gospel, that declared the gospel unreservedly. As I learned, if you go back to the seventh verse of the 119th Psalm, he said, as I learn your righteous regulations, he said, I will thank you. Some think this may have been Ezra that wrote this psalm. I'm, I'm not sure right now. It doesn't really matter. But he said, as I learn your righteous regulations, I will thank you. As by, I will thank you as by living as I should. That's how we thank you. Yes. I will obey your decrees. Then he said, please, God, don't give up on me. Amen. The only way God will give up on you, you'll just have to walk so far away from Amen. home that you just simply can't find your way back. Amen. It's not his will or his way to give up on us, but it is his will, it is his way for us for us to live our lives, to compare our lives with His Word. I believe that with all of my heart. A man once said to D.L. Moody, now that I'm converted, must I give up the world? I, I've heard that so many times. <laughs> no, replied Moody, you need not give up the world. If you give a ringing testimony for the Son of God, the world will give you up pretty quickly. They won't want you around. That's right. Listen, Jesus was a friend to the sinner. Yes, he was. And at any point in time he hung out with the sinner, his reason and his purpose was to get them to hear the message. Yes, to give them something that only he could give them. Yes, he did. <laughs> oh, people are so ignorant that they think Jesus would go to these parties and drink and get high and be sexual and honor. That's the craziest stuff in this. Don't you believe that mess? That's right. Amen. Amen. That's what it is. Amen. The world is not your friend. Once your life reflects God's Word, the world won't want to hang out with you. You've heard me tell this before. Early on in my Christian experience, I'd run with the wild crowd for such a long time, all my teenage life. When I gave my heart to Jesus, they heard about it. I even witnessed to, uh, in my day, in the area I was raised in, I don't know if you even know the term or not, but they called it bootlegging whiskey. They would go to a liquor store and buy it by the gallon, and they'd break it down into small pint bottles put their label on it and sell it to us drunks. But my friends heard about my change of life. Somebody said, did you know Bobby Garman? Got religion? Well, I didn't get religion. But boy, I sure got a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. And did you know, in that short brief of time, God gave me such a precious opportunity to witness to the man that sold me the whiskey. I went to pay him some money that I owed him for the previous week. And as I paid him for what I'd purchased from him, the rock gut, that previous week, I said his name was Ollie Spangler. And I said, Ollie, I've come to pay you what I owe you, okay? And he said, well, how much more do you need? I said, I don't need any more, Ollie. Listen, they knew I had a newfound friend. They knew that something had happened in my life. And I want to tell you, when you really get that fiery testimony for Jesus, the world don't want to hang out with you. They come to my house for weeks afterward. They yell at me, Bobby, let's go. Let's do this. Let's do that. I said, no, boys. I mean, I didn't preach to them. I wasn't preaching. I said, no, boys, not today. The last voice I heard from one of my buddies, he said, you still on the wagon? I said, I'm still on the wagon. And I've been on Christ's wagon for 49 years. Come this July the 15th, I've been on Christ's wagon. Hallelujah. Every day of my life, I endeavor to compare my life with this glorious book that has literally saved my life. In closing, 
there's a fable which tells of three apprentice devils that were coming to this earth to finish their apprenticeship. They were talking to Satan, the chief of the devils, about the plans to tempt and ruin men. The first devil said to Satan, I will tell them there's no God. Satan said, quickly, they won't delude, or they won't, that won't delude many of them, for they know there is a God. I want to tell you, this world knows there is a God. They are just liars and fools when they say there is no God because Job said there is a spirit in man. Every man, woman, boy, and girl. And he said the inspiration of the Almighty gives them understanding. You can deny it, but I'm here to tell you I don't believe there's anyone that really believes there's no God. The second one, the second devil said, I'll tell them there's no hell. Satan said, you won't deceive anyone that way. Men know even now that there is a hell for sin. The third devil said, I'll tell them that there is no hurry. Quickly, Satan responded. He said, go and you will ruin men by the thousands the most dangerous of all delusions is that there is more time. Amen. Hear me this morning, everyone that watches this this week, and I hope from the mayor all the way through that you hear this. You don't have time to put off Jesus Christ until this afternoon. You can't afford to wait until next week because we are running out of time. Matter of fact, we're probably less time than any of us be, believe and understand this morning. Yes. We have just about run out of time. Yes. 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 True. In closing, the great, the late great preacher E.V. Hill said in a three-point sermon on why he accepted Christ. Point number one, he said, I didn't want to go to hell. And you know what a lot of churches today would do? They would have some of the deacons escort me out if I would let them. I'm not sure the Holy Ghost in me would let them if I got far enough to get in there to declare the word. Do you understand how important this is? Our lives must reflect God's word. It must reflect. Shall we stand? It must reflect the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right. It must compare. Listen, Paul even spoke about examining yourself. Looking deep into your heart. The psalmist David said, Search me, O God. Try my reins. Look deep into my heart, he said, to see if there's any wicked, wicked way in me. This is an everyday, ongoing experience. Just as sure as you think you've got it made, you got about all God that you feel like you want and need, that's about the time you had better really examine yourself. I have never one time ever felt like I had all of God that I wanted or all of God that I needed. There have been moments I've said to God, God, why do you love me like you love me? Why do you care for my soul like you care for me? Why did you put up with such foolishness with me the way you did? And now I find myself asking that same question about this lost and dying and hateful. Did you ever see a time, did you ever see a time in the history of you, those of you that hear my voice this morning, did you ever see a time in your lifetime that the world, our country, our society is so filled with hatred? animosity I don't believe I've, and I, I sit in my living room minding my business with my television on and I say to myself I thank God what in the world why are they being so hateful why can't they love and appreciate the freedoms that we have why can't they just simply listen to one another Amen. never saw it never 
saw such a hateful time. I'm telling you, Christians, those of us that are continuing, go ahead, Sister Velma. Those of us that are continuing day by day, we're endeavoring, we're endeavoring to reflect God's commands. We're endeavoring to compare our lives with God's Word. I want to challenge all of us this morning. And I know we don't have any young Christians here today, per se. But I want to challenge you this morning, folks. Every day, when you go to bed at night, Lord, have I, have I been obedient to your commandments? Have I reflected your commandments carefully today? And any day that you feel like that you haven't, you don't throw up your hands and quit. You don't say there's nothing to all this business. You just cry out to Jesus. Because he loves you. Because he cares for you.